All right. Hey, hey, we're going, we're live now, everybody. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy, um, yeah. Yeah. Happy uh, 2020 part two, right? Or 2022, as some people have say. Yeah. Yeah. All kinds of funny stuff out there. So we, we're going to skip 4.2, the applications of exponential, because we really need to get the logs. But I don't want to skip over. Uh, what's called logistic functions, because logistic functions are, um, they're really important, right? And uh, we can relate to them actually more than we care to uh, in today's day and age, whether we, whether we think about it this way or not. But what a logistic function is, is, is it's a modified exponential function, modified exponential. So uh, I'm gonna add a page here. I just wanna draw an exponential function that, that grows. So let, let's draw an exponential growth exponential growth. Now remember, exponential growth is in the form y equals a times b to the x. Super important, right? x is your exponent, it's your variable. Um, b is your base, and remember the legal bases were between zero and one, or what? Greater than one, that's it. If it was strictly between zero and one, it was decay, and if it was greater than one, it was growth, yeah. Now, a lot of things we talked about, I can't even write my W's, a lot of things that we talked about do grow exponentially. But um, that's really only in the short term, okay? Because a lot of the time, there are other factors that are, that are at play that, that prevent things from continuing to grow or decay um, at that same rate forever and ever and ever. Now, in theory, it could happen, right? If I put my money into the bank account, um, at 5% interest, every single year, I'm going to get an additional 5% of the balance, right, added to my account. And how long would that continue, in theory? Forever. If I live to be older than Methuselah, right, who was, what, 900-something years? If I live to be a, a kabillion years old, right, in theory, that money would continue to, to go. But that's not really what happens, right? It's not really what happens, um, some people's count uh, gets, gets uh, terminated for various reasons before infinity ever gets close, right? Um, we also talked about like cell division. Cell division, mitosis, meiosis, that grew exponentially as well, right? One cell splits to become two, two become four, four become eight, eight becomes 16, times two, times two, times two, times two, right? That could also happen in theory forever and ever and ever and ever. But let's think about like uh, just bacteria culture in a Petri dish, okay? That way we don't have to like, um, you know, bring up sex education again in, in the population of the world. But we got bacteria, they're in a Petri dish. Their population is doubling every whatever, okay? In theory, those bacteria can continue for infinity to double, 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 and then not only the world, but the entire universe will be overrun by these bacteria. But that's not how, how it really happens it tends to slow down after a while, right? The population will double, 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 but then it may still grow, but it won't double. Why? Think of a Petri dish. This is an aerial view of a Petri dish, right? And you got little bacteria. I'm gonna, I'm gonna use them as red, you know, like Canyon Cougar bacteria, right? Don't eat your boogers, they're full of bacteria, right? There's, there's one, right? One then splits into two. Two then split into four. Four split into eight, right? So on and so forth. Man, they're growing fast. What's going to happen over time? They're going to run out of space. There's limited space, right? If we think of this as a two-dimensional thing, right? Really, I guess it is three-dimension, but it's not that tall. Two-dimensionally, they're going to run out of space. Like if I'm continuing to put dots inside the circle, I'm going to run out of places to put dots, you know, over time. And uh, you may say that you could still zoom in and put a dot, but however thick bacteria are, let's just say for the sake of this problem, they're as thick as one of those dots. There will be a time where there's so many dots, there's not enough room to fit another dot in between. Okay. So limited space. That is a very important thing. So they may, they may continue to expand towards the, the space that they have, but it won't be at the same doubling rate. It's going to slow down at some point. 
What else are they competing for besides space? What do most living organisms need? Muscle? Oh, food, yeah. Limited space, limited food, in general, limited resources. There's limited resources, okay? I'm just trying to get, get those together. Limited space, limited food, limited resources. So if we were to think about what this growth might look like, let's give ourselves um, this, this little axis here. Now, if you looked at the top, I said, when we do applications, instead of using X, we usually use T as our independent variable because T is short for time, right? Time becomes a really good independent variable. So if we calculate time on the X axis and we calculate the number of bacteria on the Y axis, it might start like exponential. In fact, you can actually draw exponential growth. There's your horizontal asymptote and it's gonna come like this and it's gonna have, boom, that's your initial value, right? That's however many bacteria you started with. And it's gonna to continue to grow exponentially. But at some point, bacteria are gonna be like, we can't continue to double because when I double, there's not enough places to put each of the bacteria, right? Sorry guys, we've doubled, but uh, there's only enough room for, for five of us. So the rest of you have to go. And then they double again, like oh, now there's even less room. So it might continue to grow, but it's going to, instead of growing at an increasing rate, it's going to start growing at a what? Increasing. Decreasing rate. Yeah, a decreasing rate. Now, as it grows at a decreasing rate, do you think it's going to continue to go up towards infinity? Like vertically, do you think? It, no, we just said that it can't go to infinity because there's limited resources. So what's going to happen is it starts tapering off. Okay, it's still increasing, but it starts tapering off. And guess what we have up here at the top as well? We have another horizontal asymptote, okay? This is sometimes called the S-curve. And if you were listening to uh, any kind of the early talks when the pandemic was spreading really badly, you might've seen like when doctors came on the news, they put images like this up. When you talk about flattening the curve, it could be two different things. It could be like stretching this out horizontally so this S curve gets flatter, or you could also mean um, spreading out kind of like the peak, the general distribution. But this right here is called the S curve. And this is what a logistic curve looks like for growth. Logistic decay would be an S that falls from left to right, okay? And there are applications of that as well. The way a coffee cup cools, a hot cup of coffee, <laughs> Right, you buy it and it's hot, but then you lose your appetite to drink it because some feed behind you is yelling at you. And like, I I've lost my appetite. Now you just let the, the coffee cool. It's going to cool logistically, okay? Um, <clears throat> this is called a logistic curve. Now, this point right here in the middle is very, very important because notice that is where the rate of change of the bacteria changes. That's where it goes from increasing at an increasing rate to increasing at a decreasing rate. We call this right here an inflection point. What does it mean for someone's voice to inflect? At the, at the, at the most basic, it means that it changed, right? My, I inflected something, his voice timber changed or whatever. That's what inflect means. It means to change. So what changes at the inflection point? Well, it's the rate of change of the function's rate of change. We can call that the curvature. The curvature changes. We're going to talk about curvature quite a bit in calculus. Mathematically, we call that concavity. You might have heard that in your physics or science class, concave and convex. We don't have concave and convex. For us, we have concave up like a cup and concave down like a frown. All right, now for this problem here, we look at this little relevant domain. We're really only interested in this graph, you know, for, for values of t that are greater than or equal to zero. Because that's where we start our clock. We put in one bacteria and we watch it grow. So there's limitations to every model. 
But that is where the graph is curving upward. So we would say that part of the graph is concave up like a cup. Cups hold water. So it's part of a smile, in other words. After the inflection point, we say it's concave down like a frown. Concave down like a frown. It's part of a frown. So any part of a smile, whether it's increasing or decreasing, is concave up. And then any part of a frown is concave down. So that is where, um, that's where the graph is the steepest. That's where the curvature or the concavity changes. And it's a very important value. Now, the question is, where is it going to happen? What's the Y value there? Well, I'm kind of running out of room down here. So let's, let's, jump, let's jump up to this diagram. We're not going to get too far with the calculators today. I'm already kind of behind, you know, but oh well. Um, if, if we switch from, from um, bacteria to students, okay, because in the bacteria situation, I don't know what the Y value is up here. That, that upper horizontal asymptote, we usually just call it L. L is called the limit to growth, right? Which would essentially be the carrying capacity. That's what also what it's called, the carrying capacity of that Petri dish. We don't know what that number necessarily is. We can maybe find it experimentally, you know, but we don't really know what it is, okay? So let's look at a, this example before, uh, that, I, that I have up here that, that we do know what it is, okay? So this, this kind of gets us into example one. Here is another S-curve, and uh, this is representing the following scenario. In 2019, from um, 2009, sorry, 13 years ago already, wow. Before COVID, the swine flu broke out. I don't know if you remember where you were in 09, but we, we called it swine 09, swine 09. We shut down school for several days, um, and we came back, but it was at the end of the year, and uh, we had to, teachers had to give um, like eight, each other's AP exams on a Saturday. It was really bad. Um, but here's an example of something that 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 is exponential or modified exponential or, or logistic growth. It's much like COVID. You had a certain if you talk about the campus with only two thousand students, and we want to look at the spread of COVID nineteen or swine flu oh nine among the student population, there has to be a patient zero, right? There has to be a patient zero. That's called patient zero because it corresponds with T equals zero. And it could be one person or a group of people, but those are the people that originally are diagnosed with you know, the virus. After a while, it's gonna, it's gonna grow very rapidly, right? Two people are in contact with others, two becomes four, four becomes eight, eight becomes 16. But at a certain point, right here at the what point, where do we call that, where the curvature changes? Inflection point, it can't continue to spread through the population of 2000 students at the same rate because look what happens. After that point, past that value of T, there are actually fewer people who have not heard, right? Then there are people who have heard. Before that point, there are more people who haven't heard than people who have heard. So it's a combination of who, who, who's, who's, I'm sorry, not heard, but who's, who've gotten COVID and who haven't gotten COVID. Past that point, this is kind of like the equilibrium point. At that equilibrium point, it's the exact same number of people who have got COVID or swine flu and the same people that haven't. But after that, there are fewer and fewer people that don't have it. So it can't continue to grow at the same rate. So based upon that, if we call the upper limit to growth here 2,000, 2,000, because it can't infect more than 2,000 students on a campus if there's only 2,000 students. That makes sense, right? Where do you think the Y value then would be of the inflection point? 1,000, exactly right. Because at that point, the number of students who have COVID or swine flu and the number of students who don't have it are exactly the same. That's the equilibrium point. And it's always at the halfway point, or in general, L divided by two. So we don't know what time it is just yet, but if we know that there's 2,000 students on campus, that, that swine flu or COVID is gonna be spreading the fastest when exactly 1,000 students are sick, okay? And hopefully we shut the school down before that, right? Y'all are really safely minded people. So like y'all would be like, sir, I would be for shutting down the school if just one person got sick, right? Let's just stay home. In fact, 
let's not even take the risk. Let's just all go home. And uh, why, why get anybody sick, right? Not y'all. A lot of people had a hard time coming to school today, right? But not y'all. Y'all sprung out of bed. Oh, we get to see Mr. Corby first thing in the morning. I had a hard time waking up. Okay, there's the honesty right there. Yeah, oh, before school, right? Okay, so anyway, we're not going to get to the specific example. We'll get to that tomorrow. We'll do this tomorrow. And then we're going to quiz on Wednesday. You don't really need your calculators. I'm so sorry, except for the warm-up. We did use them for the warm-up. So if you want to go ahead and put your calculator away, I apologize. I thought I'd get further, but, you know, things happen. You, oh, do we? No. What? Oh, we're until 10.03. Keep your calculators. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, sh I even mentioned this to my first period class. That there, we're not, sometimes we correct everything in first period and we run a regular schedule after that. But I forgot today, we're, 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 um, we're getting the time back from advisory by not having the advisory later in the day. So we still have 50 minutes in each class. Yeah, yeah, there it is. It's right here if you want to take a picture of it. Thank you. I, I prefer this better. I like, I like having the advisory in the middle because we can still see each other for 50 full minutes. Because first period used to always get the short end of the stick. If, if handing out schedules took like 40 minutes, you go to your first period class for like five minutes, and then it gets everything off. So thank you, Brady. All right, so this is what we know. We know that this point right here, let's go ahead, let's go ahead and um, talk about it a little bit more. This point here is the inflection point. And let, let's start listing a few things that we know about it. It's where the concavity changes. Yeah, concavity is also the curvature. <clears throat> uh, no, it's still increasing on both sides. Notice it's still going up on both sides, but it is where the rate of change of the spread changes. So you're talking about a rate of change of a rate of change. Um, so we could say it's, it's where the graph is the steepest, right? Graph is steepest. So Brady, what you mean is that that's where it's growing at the fastest rate. We could say that as well. It's a separate bullet point. Growing at fastest rate. And it's going to be um, when y equals L over two. We, we don't know the, the X value or the T value, the input value, but if we know that upper limit to growth, we know there's only 2000 students, then we know it's gonna be growing the fastest when half of them, exactly half of them, a thousand, okay? So if we knew what the carrying capacity of the Petri dish was, we would know then the bacteria would be growing at the fastest rate when it's at half that population, okay? All right. Um, <clears throat> So any questions then on the S-curve? All right. Um, this is, I didn't even read this top part. I don't know if you did, but uh, we, we talked about what else spreads exponentially in the short run, not just populations, but information, right? Information like rumors. So it could, it could be instead of spreading COVID or, or swine 09, it could be something, you know, as different, I'm not going to say it's harmless because rumors can be just as devastating as COVID to some people, right? You don't want to do that either. But because it's tr it's transmitted through people, same thing, right? Rumors can spread, but they're not going to continue to grow exponentially forever and ever and ever because there's only a certain amount. There's a carrying capacity. So most growth in the real world is only exponential in the short term. And what happens over time is it tends to look more and more like a modified exponential, the S curve, uh, which is um, <clears throat> called what? What type of curve? How do we say that? Logistic? Is it a hard G or a soft G? Logistic. Yeah, it's, it's more like a J sound. We're going to study logarithms in the next section, L-O-Gs for short, log -g -g rhythms. But this is la j, j with a J sound, logistic. Now, before we get into it, since we do have a little more time than I, than I remembered, um, let's look at um, an instance where it would be logistic but decaying. I'll use Beefy Brown here. Let's say Brady's mother 
stays in line and we're measuring the temperature of our coffee in degrees Fahrenheit over time. And let's do in let's do minutes since she got her coffee at t equals zero. Okay. Um, the original temperature of the coffee might be what, Brady? When it comes out, it's pretty hot, right? It would be a reasonable. It's hot. Yeah, it's hot, but it isn't enough to like burn your tongue. No, 120, 130, 150. Let's just say it's 150 degrees. I don't really know. I drink a lot of coffee, but I always put ice in my coffee. I like to chug it warm, not sip it hot. Okay, so when when that when that temperature first comes out, it's at some initial temperature, and and will it actually be 150 degrees? I don't know because the the cup itself is an insulator, but it's going to have some initial temperature. Now Brady's mother gets so uh, such a distaste in her mouth from the feeb that she decides she's she's lost her coffee appetite. You know, so the temperature. I know this is hypothetical, right? The temperature is going to decay. It's going to fall, but will it continue to look like that forever and ever as time goes on? No, because if it does, it's going to cross the axis. It's going to go like into. It's going to her coffee's going to freeze, and then it's going to go past absolute zero, right? And then it, yeah, that's not going to happen. But because there's more temperature to lose in the beginning, it's going to lose the more the most temperature in the beginning. But then it's going to continue to cool off, but it will taper. Now, this one doesn't taper necessarily to the x-axis. This one will taper off towards y equals what? Room temp. Very good. Room temperature. So if you know what the temperature of the room is, and you know what the original temperature of the coffee is, you can actually figure out that the coffee is going to be cooling at the fastest rate at y equals the uh, half of whatever 150 minus room temperature is. Yeah, 150 minus room temperature, that's the distance between the two horizontal asymptotes, and then you divide it by two, okay? And again, if she just left her coffee sitting on the, on, in, in her car, assuming that the outside elements, usually if this happens in the house, you set it down, and there's a thermostat and the house stays at a consistent, whatever, 67 degrees if you're in my house. Summer or winter, 67. Yeah, I like it cold. I hate sweating. Uh-uh. That's why I decided to get married in January. Did I tell you that story? Yeah. And it was 100 degrees that day. So anyway, there you go. There's an application of logistic decay. This one is actually called Newton's Law of Cooling. Have you all heard of Newton's Law of Cooling in another class? Like in your Newton class? Science class, Newton's law of cooling. It's named after the guy who came up with the delicious cookies, Fig Newtons. He took them out of the oven and they cooled and then they tapered off room temperature. And he's like, I, I need to develop a theory about this. Yeah, Newton's law of cooling. He did so many things. It's unfair that one guy has it all, right, Jeff Bezos? All right, back in the day, Isaac, Isaac Newton was the Jeff Bezos of the day. He went to space and all that good stuff, okay? In fact, Isaac Newton was the first astronaut. Did you know that? I made that up. I'm, I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying. Like when, when Coach Richter comes here, I want to throw out just random trivia and see if she starts buying into it. Right? She's either going to say, "Well, I didn't know that," or "Corpy is a kook." Right? Anyway, let's. Let, do we have time for this one? We have. We have. Let's set this one up because we do have six minutes. Okay. So this is the one we're going to work with the calculator. Uh, and then your homework, which will not be due tomorrow, it'll be due Wednesday, and we'll quiz Wednesday over one question like this. In 2009, legit, MBHS, with about 2,200 students, um, closed its doors because of the swine flu. I was here for it, I remember. Assuming that the, fly, the swine flu spreads to the campus according to this logistic equation. This is a very characteristic look of what a logistic equation looks like. Now, the graph starts off looking like exponential growth, but the equation doesn't look anything really like exponential growth. But if you do look in the bottom, the second term in the bottom, the second factor is E, the natural base, 2.718, raised to some variable power. So there's your exponential piece in this equation. But this is the most convenient form of the, of the equation. You got 2,200 in the top, all over one plus some number times your exponential piece. Now, this 2200 in the top 
Was that an important number as I read the question? In 2009? Yeah. yeah. That's, your, that's the total number of students on campus. That's your upper horizontal asymptotes Y value. Yes. So that's what's nice about logistic equations in this form. This number here is your L, or I should say like this, L equals 2200, okay? And for growth like this, we always have a horizontal at, at zero as well, okay? It's not like the cooling where it cools to room temperature. So we have two horizontal asymptotes, one at Y equals zero and one at Y equals 2200, we know that. And then the rest of it, one plus some number. Okay, so um, S is gonna represent the number of students who have been infected T days after it starts, where T equals zero is the first day that it was beginning to spread, okay? So again, the power of the mathematical equation is we can use it to model real life experiences, but there are limitations. In this case, we don't even wanna look at negative values of X or negative values of T because they might apply to the function, but they don't apply to the relevant circumstances that we're dealing with here, okay? So we always come up with a relevant domain. So for this problem, we're gonna look just at, for T instead of X, T for time, greater than or equal to zero, okay? T greater than or equal to zero. So to get use of your calculator, the first thing you're gonna do is type this in. So let's let this be like the last thing that we do. I'm gonna turn it on. Remember to go to Y equals, how do you get the horizontal division bar? Alpha Y equals number one, or y'all can actually do um, alpha X. Y'all, the new ones have the horizontal division bar as, a, as an alpha character on the X variable. Otherwise, it's alpha y equals. So two, two, zero, zero, all over one plus nine, 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 e. E to the power of is second ln, remember? Second ln down the left-hand side. And then negative 0.1. And then our calculator always likes to use x. It doesn't matter what variable we're calling our input on our paper, but your calculator likes to call them x's and y's, x's and y's. So click to the right, double check, triple check, make sure that that looks good. And then of course, if you hit zoom six, which is your standard negative 10 to 10 viewing window, look what you're gonna see. There you go. That looks like exponential growth, doesn't it? How's that viewing window for what we want? It's not good. Yeah, it's a little, it's a little um, myopic. It's a little bit uh, narrow focused. Right. One of the best parts about these types of problems is because you have to think about what a relevant window would be. So let's think about it. For our values of T and our values of S, we're measuring time in days on the T axis. So what might be a good lower bound? Zero, right? Patient zero. Now, how many days do you want to let go? I'm going to put an epsilon here instead of a colon. How many days do you want to let go before we take a look? Right now we're looking at 10 days and we don't see much, right? So let, let's give it a month. Let's do 30 days. This is the one, this upper bound, this is kind of just trial and error based upon what you're measuring. If we were measuring years on the y-axis, I would probably only go out to one or 0.5 even, right? Because we're measuring days, let's let a month go by. Now, if we're measuring students, the fewest number of students we can have is zero and the maximum number of students we can have is what? 2,200. This is how you come up with your relevant window. So now if you go to your window and you go from zero to 30, X min, X max, leave your X scale at one, it doesn't matter. And then you go from zero to 2,200 and you can leave your scale at one, that's fine. X min, X max, Y min, Y max, now hit graph. And if you see an S curve, that means that you're, you're doing a great job. Do y'all see an S curve? No, but I see like the line beginning to form. I see the line beginning to form. So what does that tell me about a month? Uh, that it's just starting to I need to go out further. Let's go out, let's go out, let's go out 200 days. I'm gonna come down here and switch 30 to 200. Well, that's fine. Ah, do we see the S curve? Yes. Yeah. Now I might come back and trim off a few of the days because it gets to the S curve and then it appears to flatten out. But that upper bound on your input 
that's the one that you have to kind of play with. Everything else, your lower bound and then your y-axis, you should know. We don't start answering the questions until we see the S-curve graph, because that means we might have the wrong equation in, all right? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm a day off. Today's not Monday, thank you. We'll do the question on Tuesday, and then today is Tuesday. Help me. Wednesday, we'll do the problem. Thursday, we'll quiz. Yeah. So anyway, go ahead and turn your calculators back in and, and enjoy the rest of your, of your splendid day.